So thank you everybody for joining our webinar. Um, as you all know, we'll be talking about South Africa and the prospects for a post-COVID recovery. Um, we've got some exciting guest speakers and uh, we are delighted to have you all joining the conference. So Bianca, we'll jump to the next slide. All right, before we kick off, for those of you who don't really know a lot about Warwick, just a little bit more information. We are a local international wealth, wealth management business. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we are part of a larger group of financial services companies, including Katie's Asset Management, which I'm sure most of you will know, Appleton Fiduciary Services, and then also Acorn, which is a more venture capital type business. We've got offices across the country, being two offices in Cape Town, Claremont and Constantia. We've got offices in Johannesburg, Maros Arch, Nomschlanga, Durban, two offices in PE, and then also Nasla in East London. And we do manage over 10 billion in clients, investments and estates. And investment, international investment diversification is one of the cornerstones of our financial planning philosophy and also methodology. So I think it's such a key thing to talk about where to invest, both locally and internationally, and therefore we've got some great guest speakers. Next slide. So just a brief introduction. Uh, I think most of you all know Davi Rudd by now. Uh, Davi is the Director and Chief Economist at the Efficient Group, um, being a national, nationally renowned economist with a master's degree in economics and over 30 years experience in the field. And he's ranked as the most referenced economist in the country and has presented at over 800 television shows and 1,500 radio programs in his career. Davi will be providing us with an overview of the South African international economic landscape. Then secondly, we've got Tim Hughes. <coughs> Tim is our Group Corporate Affairs Director. Uh, he holds a BA Honours and MA Cum Laude at the University of Cape Town in Political Studies. He's also got a Master's um, <coughs> of Studies Cum Laude at the University of Cambridge, as well as a Postgraduate Diploma in Global Business at Oxford University's Business School. He was also awarded the Medingley Prize at Cambridge University as the top Master's Student in International Relations. And Tim will be telling us a little bit more about <clears throat> an overview of the major international and local political developments, particularly those that have relevance for the international and local markets. Before we kick off, just a, a quick um, information on how to ask questions throughout the presentation. Next slide. All right. So um, in relation to asking you questions, if you're on your laptop or mobile device, you'll see those little uh, question mark buttons with the two little blocks where you can ask any questions throughout the presentation and when we get to the end of it we will answer as many of them as possible. So without further ado, uh, Darby I'll hand over to you and we can jump to the next slide. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, very nice uh, being with you all. Thank you very much for the invite. So uh, my job is to have a look at the South African economy and see if we can see find out what is likely to happen in future and I'm afraid uh, it's probably not that good news. Uh, so a couple of things to start off with is that I'm going to have a look at the world and the South African economy before BC, before Corona, uh, and then some international trends, politically and political and economic trends that I think is important. Local politics, of course, that's not my expertise. I will leave most of that to my esteemed colleague uh, and then some economic numbers that I would like to share with you as well. Next slide, please. All right, first, I think it's important to understand that there were certain trends uh, pretty much well established before this virus. And maybe at this stage, you should make the comment that the virus hardly had any impact on the local or for that matter on the international economy. We all have to understand that the impact is not because of the virus. The impact is because of the measures that have been put in place to contain the virus. It's important to make a distinction here because then we should ask the question, was the lockdown the right thing to do? Nevertheless, we've seen the many trends that were well established before this. The so-called gig economy was really well established. That's the Uber of the Ubers of the world, for example. Online shopping was very much part of our lives already before this. Of course, there was an explosion in online shopping after the lockdown. Retail was already changing quite significantly. Retail, that the traditional retail that we know that we are uh, accustomed to uh, until now, and working from home is nothing new, really. We are also artificial intelligence and algorithms, all those sort of things are taking over our world, and the lockdown simply accelerated many of these trends already, uh, already well established. Next slide, please. Um, 
a few, obviously, maybe as you just stand back for a moment and look at the nature of economies and how economies have been changing in the last couple of thousands of years, in fact. But there's an important change taking place that we could see, especially the last couple of years. It's something that's actually accelerating. And that is, is that if you economies are uh, start off in the primary industries, that's typically at the agriculture and mining industries. And from there, you move into the second phase of economic development, and that's in the manufacturing industries. And from there, typically, we move into the, the tertiary industries. And that is typically things like, for example, the service industry. If you look at poor countries, most economic activities are concentrated in the primary industries. And then from there, as you, the economies get wealthier, they move into the secondary sec sector like manufacturing. And that is exactly where China is at the moment, as an example. And then from there, they move over to the service industry. We find the rich countries mostly. Most of Europe and countries like, for example, the Japanese and so on are also mostly uh, active in what's called what known as the tertiary industry. And that is also where we find uh, the fourth industrial revolution. That's typically things like what we're doing exactly now. That Zoom and Teams meetings and Microsoft and that sort of stuff. So the winners, because of um, uh, the, the the virus, which is simply or the measures that have been put in place, is simply accelerating some of these. Uh, but the winners will be those guys that can move from the primary and secondary industries into the tertiary industries. And uh, and of course, the tertiary industries, especially the digital part of the tertiary industries, are the big winners. And the service part, not all, but mostly, you will find the winners mostly in the tertiary industries. The losers, of course, as always, will be the lowest skilled individuals. Uh, and we see, and I will give you some numbers a little bit later, jobs that are repetitive of nature. And of course, those that cannot transform. Maybe a very important point here is that there are, in fact, many jobs that are being lost in the tertiary industry as well. And some of these jobs are highly specialized jobs. A good one, a good example is that I think it's Amazon that created an, an app with artificial intelligence recently that is better in identifying uh, certain uh, dermatological issues like, for example, cancer cells better than the best trained dermatologists out there. There are super specialists and computers can actually do their jobs better. So that's an example. We are in a world of change, which is very painful but it's also a world with amazing opportunities. And that is, I think, where we should be concentrating on. Next slide, please. Um, now, this is not my expertise, but uh, this is important for us to understand that uh, politics is always more important than economics, because politics quite often set the tune for what can be expected in terms of the economy. Now, this is just a slide where I, where I uh, talk about new nationalism, which, uh, and my colleague, of course, will expand on this, and he's much better qualified to talk about this. But this is what I call new nationalism. New nationalism typically started, I mean, of course, we saw trends of this before the time, but I think Brexit is a good example of new nationalism. Trump is a good one. Uh, South America, Joel Bolsonaro is also known as a tropical Trump. It's an example of new nationalism. Modi is a Hindu nationalist. In Eastern Europe, many examples of new nationalism. I think Putin is also an example of new nationalism. Now, why this is important is because quite often it leads to some sort of economic conflict. And the trade war between Trump and the Chinese was because of a change in the political landscape. And of course, that will impact especially small emerging countries like, for example, uh, South Africa is quite, quite, quite a lot because we are a small open economy. So whatever the big guys do, if they start a trade war, countries like, for example, will be like South Africa, for example, will be affected uh, quite significantly. We already seeing that. Next slide, please. Another something else that I think it's important to understand is what a certain uh, what monetary policies, uh, policies internationally are that is changing. Now, the world central banks the big ones, I'm talking about the Americans and the Europeans, the European central banks, but even some of the other ones, like, for example, the Japanese, are following a completely different monetary policy approach than what we've been come, become accustomed to. The word quantitative easing is a new word, and we first heard about this the past 10 years, and central banks today are very, very powerful institutions, and they're involved in all sorts of things that traditionally were not the domain or the responsibilities of central banks. 
Now, one of those things that they started doing is they started print, printing money out of nothing, and they used this money to buy certain financial instruments. And in this instance, the graph that I have here is the 10-year bond yields, the American 10-year bond yields, or TBs, and their Federal Reserve or their central bank has been buying many, many billions of dollars worth of long of, of American debt instruments. And in the process, what they are doing, they're forcing long-term inter interest rates down as well. Now, this is important for many, many different reasons. One is that when long yields are this low, it's usually an indication of weakish future economic growth. Secondly, when long yields are this low, they are very unattractive for fund managers. So fund managers, instead of putting money in bonds, for example, they would try to put, find a return somewhere else and quite often they'll go into the equity markets. And that's part of the reason why we saw a very nice run on the equity markets internationally and locally, because the alternative, the bonds, are simply not attractive enough. There are many countries in the world where bond yields are in fact negative, 10-year bond yields are in fact negative, like for example the Germans. And that means that if you want to lend money to the German government, you have to pay the Germans before they take your money. Next slide, please. The next thing that central banks do is that they also cut short-term interest rates. And this is what central banks have done. Uh, currently, the interest rates in the US is close to zero, and in some countries in Europe, for example, uh, interest rates are in fact below zero. In fact, it is possible to calculate what interest rates were globally for the past, and this is not a typo, for the past 8,000 years. And in the history of mankind, at least for the past 8,000 years, we have never seen interest rates this low. And central banks decided to push interest rates to exceptionally low levels, and I must tell you one thing that I am a little bit concerned about is that we may eventually internationally experience something called inflation. It's not there yet. We may see it eventually. Next slide, please. All right, just to indicate how the extent of the interference in the world's financial markets, this is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve in the United States. And the reason for this graph uh, is simply how much the balance on the balance sheet or the assets on balance sheet of the Fed is. And you can see the sudden huge increase in 2020 and compare that to 20, uh, uh, 2008 when they started with quantitative easing. And I just want you to compare what they're doing currently to what they did in 2008. And you can see that they are really, we thought that central banks went out of their way to support the world financial markets of 2008. And they're doing much, much more today. Next slide, please. Um, I get the question quite often, will the American dollar cease to be the world's dominant currency? I even get the question quite often that people ask me, is the American dollar going to disappear? And the short answer to that is no. It's not going to disappear, at least not for quite some time. And here are some reasons why. The one is the, the US dollar is the single most important currency, of course, when it comes to international trade. A second important one is that central banks like to keep US dollars uh, as part of their official foreign uh, reserves, forex reserves, including the, the South African Central Bank. And then perhaps the most important reason is that because of their very deep capital markets in the United States, I'll explain that just now, there are very few alternatives with the exception perhaps of the euro, but eventually, like all everything, it will come to an end, but we're certainly not there. Let me just explain what I mean with the deep capital markets. Um, what happens, for example, in the case of South Africa, if we export, say, platinum, uh, the exporter will receive dollars. And of course, a little bit more complicated, but eventually these dollars will end up with the South African Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank will print rands and give it to the original exporter, and they will receive rands. But the South African Reserve Bank, Mr. Chakanyaho, doesn't take these dollars and put it under bed somewhere. He takes these dollars and he reinvests it back into some dollar denominated instrument and the most liquid dollar denominated well the most liquid instrument out there is in fact american bonds and that is a so-called tb or the 10-year tb to be more specific and that's where the city can offer the south african reserve bank invest those dollars uh, in a very very deep capital market in the american 
uh, capital market. And that's part of the reason why the dollar will remain dominant, because they've got a very deep and a very liquid capital market behind it. Now, let's compare that to example to the renminbi, the Chinese currency. Uh, that it's unlikely for the renminbi become, to become soon a dominant currency because there are many foreign exchange regulations. You can't put money in and out of China. So that disqualifies the renminbi for becoming a dominant currency like the dollar is for now at least. And another a reason why the euro is unlikely to become a dominant currency yet is because the capital market is pretty much fragmented. Um, you've got, you either lend money to the Italians or to the Germans or to whoever, but you don't lend money uh, to the Europeans as such. That is probably going to change now. Uh, they've issued a new bond, a 750 billion euro bond that will that is basically uh, supported by all current countries in the euro area and that's the beginning of a deep real deep capital market in europe and that will certainly support the euro as a potential rival to the dollar itself but for now the dollar is here to stay for it for for at least for some time the dollar is probably going to come under some pressure we've seen that and that's part of the reason why the gold price has gone up but don't think the dollar will be replaced soon by anything else. Next slide, please. Something about South Africa, and again, this is not my expertise. I'll leave it to my esteemed colleague a little bit later. But there are a couple of things that we need to understand, and that is that we have that we've got a government that's caused immense damage to the South African economy. I believe there's a leadership issue that first needs to be answered. Uh, I believe there's an ideological issue that needs to be answered. We know we want to know what the ANC or the tripartite alliance stands for. And thirdly, what is important, whoever is in charge of the ANC must know that there must be some sort of confrontation with organized labor, especially Kusatu, uh, because without somebody uh, putting Kusatu in their place, it will basically be impossible to save the fiscal accounts from complete and total collapse. I'll show you some numbers just now. So those are the three issues uh, politically that I believe should be addressed. On the ideological question, um, I do not know what the ANC stands for because, or the tripartite alliance stands for, because we're continuously getting different messages from the tripartite alliance. Um, but on the, on the ideological question, perhaps we should rather not try to figure out what the ANC stands for ideologically, we simply should accept that the ANC doesn't stand for anything, it only stands for itself. So maybe we give them far too much credit and the ANC is simply there to live off the state. Again, about politics, there are a couple of things, politics and economics that we need to answer. We must ask the question, who is responsible for this mess in which we are in? And I, with, I have no doubt that it is mostly the fault of the ANC government. Secondly, we should ask the question, can they change? So in future, are we going to have a different government? Well, looking at what's been happening in the past two years or so, it doesn't look like it. So I doubt that. The third question that we need to answer, and I'll give you some numbers now, what are the economic aggregates like? Uh, are we in a position where we can turn some of these things around? And certainly the answer to that is yes, we can turn it around, but it's going to be extremely and very, very difficult. Next slide, please. All right, I just want to talk about the second quarter's economic growth numbers because there's a lot of confusion on what it actually means. People say that the economy did not contract by 51%. The contraction was actually much less. But the reality is we calculate economic growth in a, using a certain formula. Perhaps it's the wrong formula in the current environment. Uh, maybe we should uh, use something else, but this is what we use at the moment. And if we want to be consistent, we have to keep on using this. Uh, let me just make so let me just explain how it's calculated first of all what we do we remove the effect of inflation and that's called a real adjustment to get a real number an actual number without the distortion caused by inflation so that's the real number secondly what we do we also adjust the numbers for seasonal factors for instance the maize harvest period is in the second quarter uh, it's not in the fourth quarter so it doesn't make sense to adjust, to compare maize harvest the th second quarter to, to the fourth quarter. You have to adjust for certain things to smooth it over time. The same goes for, for tourism. Tourism uh, does much better in the fourth quarter than in the first quarter, for example. You have to adjust for these sort of things for seasonal factors. And that's what's, we, what's been done in the second quarter as well. So we smoothed some of these numbers to get a seasonally adjusted figure. 
Thirdly, what we do, we compare the second quarter to the previous, the quarter just before that, or the um, first quarter, and uh, percentage change, and then we express it as in an annualized uh, manner. And that's the big question. Should we annualize this number? Because in the current very volatile environment, the contraction in the second quarter was totally out of the ordinary, and that's the reason for this massive, huge contraction in the second quarter because of the lockdown. We basically stopped the economy. Should we actually analyze it or should we not? Remember, the idea with this specific formula is to try to calculate the underlying momentum of the economy. And I, I think it is a little bit unfair to make use of the specific formula because it doesn't give us an indication of the underlying momentum of the economy because certainly the economy is not going to contract by 51% in a year in total. Uh, so there's another way, next slide please, that we can do that, and that is simply compare the first, uh, the second quarter to the first quarter without uh, annualizing the number, in which case the contraction was about 16 or 17%. We could also compare it to the first quarter or the second quarter last year, in which case we do not have to make a seasonal adjustment because we're comparing the same season to the same season. Nevertheless, let me show you some graphs to show you where we are. Next slide, please. And that is the, the South African economy contracting uh, by roughly about 17% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Maybe I can just make one or two comments. Uh, this is the deepest contraction. doesn't matter what, what you look at, whether you look at quarter-on-quarter -quarter numbers or annualized numbers. This is the deepest contraction of the South African economy. The South African economy has been contracting now for four quarters in a row. Two quarters um, is needed for a so-called technical uh, recession. So we've been contracting for four quarters in a row. Next slide, please. So we are in, certainly in a technical recession, but not only are we in a technical recession, we are in a very, very deep technical recession. In fact, I would call it a depression. Uh, we, the last time we saw a similar sort of thing was during the Great Depression. And I think this is going to be worse and perhaps even significantly worse than the Great Depression. In fact, we were in trouble before the lockdown, very, very deep in trouble. Next slide, please. So we are in a, what I would certainly call a very deep depression. Just a few highlights or lowlights, if you like, uh, if you analyze the numbers in the second quarter. Remember, we can also calculate, usually we look at the supply side, the menu, well, the, the, the supply side of the economy. You can also look at the demand side of the economy. So there are two ways of calculating the economy. In economists don't even all agree on what should be included in the economy, but here are some numbers that I think are important. Manufacturing contracted by 75% in the second quarter, which is absolutely, absolutely horrible. It is particularly bad because that is a sector where we can potentially create a lot of jobs and that we are in fact, for the last couple of years, the South African economy is going through a process of de-industrializing. Another one that I think is very important is a capital formation, which contracted by 60%. Basically, that's investments. And investments in the second quarter in, in contracted by 60%. And that is particularly important because investments or capital form formation is that indicator that can tell you what's going to happen to future economic growth. And future economic growth, clearly, if you don't invest, you're not going to grow in the future. On the demand side, something that I want to point out, demand or consumption expenditure, in, this, in the second quarter contracted by about 50%, and we all know this, just go and ask the retailers or just about everybody, there was a complete collapse in demand in the economy uh, in the second quarter. Next slide, please. Um, what's going to happen now in the future? Remember, uh, think, uh, if you talk about uh, economic growth, the conventional way of calculating economic growth, it's quarter on quarter, seasonally adjusted, uh, real numbers, annualized and all that. The second quarter was an absolutely horrible quarter with a contraction of 50%, 51%, and that created a very low base for the third quarter. So it's quite possible that in the third quarter we can see economic growth, a bounce back in economic growth of 20 or 30% or even more in the third quarter, simply because the, and the th second quarter, quarter was such a horrible quarter. So if we see 20 or 30% growth in the third quarter, do not for one moment think we are of a, what I prefer to call a depression. The economy is still significantly weaker than only a year ago. So we are, will still be in a very, very bad spot, even if we see the numbers turning around, because the numbers are turning around simply because 
of uh, certain technical reasons. And then there are some other issues that will put a lid on economic growth. One is ESCOM. Before the lockdown, uh, the economy was governed in a way. There was a ceiling of economic to, to economic growth of approximately one and a half percent, simply because we did not have enough electricity. Uh, we're probably going to lose, say, a quarter of the generation capacity of ESCOM over the next five years or so because of um, many plants simply getting too old. Uh, and of course, we know there are many issues that we do pay in the city and so on. So ESCOM is still an obstacle to economic growth. And there are many other obstacles as well. I've highlighted some of those, political, but there are some other obstacles as well. And I'm going to touch on some of those just now. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do I expect for this year? This is what I expect for this year, even after the release of the economic growth numbers for the second quarter, which I expected more or less. Um, I, my numbers are still the same, economic contraction for the year in total of approximately 10%. I see the OECD reckons it's going to be in excess of 11%, so my number is about 10% economic contraction. Uh, we've released, uh, already lost 3 million jobs, at least a million of that will be permanent losses. At 100,000 businesses will close their doors. Uh, and this is a very, this is a calculation that I've done. I've looked at what happened in Greece during their financial crisis in 2009-2010. And uh, remember, the biggest killer out there is not a virus, it's not cancer. The biggest killer out there is poverty. The poverty kills more things than all these other bad things put together. And if the Greek numbers are anything to go by, then we are, because of the massive increase in poverty in South Africa now, we're probably going to lose about 300,000 jobs over the next 10 years because of the massive increase in poverty in South Africa. And compare that to an expected uh, possible human loss of less than 20,000 because of, of uh, COVID-19. So more, many more people will die because of the increase in poverty. And that's the reason why I am of course, uh, high science is always easier, but soon after the lockdown, many economists started calling on government to open up the economy as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, because of these sort of numbers, and I think what we should do now is to completely open up the economy with certain, with the responsibility on the individual, social distancing and all that. But we have to understand far more people will die because of poverty than people because uh, of the COVID-19. Next slide, please. This slide, uh, this is the fiscal deficit. It's not only the private sector that will be affected by this. Uh, the state, the fiscal deficit of the state, that is how much the Minister of Finance is going to borrow, will has exploded. They will need to borrow approximately 800 billion rand this year. Of that 800 billion rand that they're going to borrow, 500 billion rand of that will be spent on current expenditure. So that's not a good idea to borrow money long-term money to pay for your groceries because what you're doing basically you're destroying savings or you're destroying capital and this is the extent of destruction caused by government is that they will destroy approximately 500 billion rands worth of capital in this year it's because of borrowing of about 800 billion the, the increase in the borrowing requirement was mostly because of a collapse in tax revenue and tax revenue this year will be about more than 300 billion below the original budgeted estimates uh, leading to this huge increase in the fiscal deficit. Next slide, please. All right, this is the Minister of Finance's graph. He says if we do nothing, state debt will simply accelerate and state debt will exceed 100% of GDP within three years. Uh, but if we try to do something, that's the bottom line. We can slow down this rate of increase in state debt and we can actually turn it around. I don't believe we're going to be able to, to follow the lower tra tra trajectory. I think it will stay at debt currently uh, is in the current financial year uh, is probably going to exceed 80% of GDP. Remember that there's a lot of debt not included in this specific number that the Minister of Finance uh, used to, to calculate this graph, like for example, ESCOM. ESCOM's outstanding debt is 500 billion South African Airways. We know what's going on there. Prasa, the whole lot. The whole lot of them are operationally and financially have been destroyed. So this is a, what's called a fiscal debt trap. And we are pretty much in a fiscal debt trap. The only way that we can get out of this is if we dramatically cut back on state spending, 
And in order to cut back on state spending, it is inevitable. We must spend less on things like, for example, South African Airways, and we have to reduce the wage bill of this army of civil servants that we pay. And in order to do that, you have to take control or at least prevent Kusatu uh, from chucking or doing what they usually do in the streets. So that's why I say that is one of our biggest political questions. Whoever is in charge of the ANC need to take control of Kusatu as well or convince Kusatu to take a, a cut as far as the, way, uh, the, the wage bill is concerned. Next, next slide, please. All right, this is just our per capita GDP. Uh, we were in trouble beforehand. For the past five years, every year, we've been getting poorer and poorer. And we will see a collapse in per capita income this year, a collapse of nearly 14% in per capita GDP, uh, knocking us back to where we were last in 1981. Next slide, please. Durant, maybe uh, everybody, please don't go and jump off a high place. After you've listened to me, there's a lot still going uh, that's good in South Africa. One of those certainly is the, the South African Reserve Bank. Lesetja Kaneaku is doing an excellent job. Uh, the job of the central bank is to protect the, the value of the currency. The currency is still used in South Africa, so we're not a, a failed state, certainly not yet. Its currency is actually used around South Africa. Most countries around us use the currency as well, but the currency is weak. The currency is one of the weakest currencies in the world. And it's currently trading just above 16 to the US dollar. Um, and usually I would, under these sort of circumstances, not take money out of the country. But in, in our case, what we do, we take money. To, so the moment we dip below 17, we take, the, we take money out. Uh, although a more realistic level is around about 14. It's not impossible for the currency to go to 14. It's, it certainly can happen. I don't think you're going to see 14. We can break, break 16. But it's, it's not impossible. And here are the reasons why I say it is, it is possible for the currency to suddenly go much stronger. Um, there are three reasons. Firstly, the currency is cheap. So a foreigner can enter South Africa very cheaply. So the entrance into South Africa is cheap. Secondly, so, so the bond yields in South Africa is approximately 10%. So it's very, very attractive uh, compared to the Germans where you have to pay them before they take your money. We pay you at least 10%. And also very importantly, South African financial markets are very, very liquid, very much integrated and very well regulated. So that's something that works very well in South Africa. So a foreigner could, a foreigner could look at South Africa as a speculator and say, listen, I can enter cheaply, I can take a bite of, out of the apple, very attractive yields, and I can run away very quickly if necessary. And those are factors that are very attractive and it may lead to a sudden inflow of capital into South Africa, but it's probably going to lead to it can potentially lead to a sudden run of capital out of South Africa as well. And that's the reason for the for the volatility on the currency. My advice to people is to make sure that a substantial portion of your assets are invested abroad. And once you are invested abroad, look at your portfolio in dollar terms or in euro terms or whatever the case may be. Cannot look at it in terms of the RAND because of the exceptionally volatile currency. So it's possible in the short term for the currency to come back uh, and quite strongly so, but over the medium longer term, only one direction for the currency. Next slide, please. And that's for a weaker currency, of course. So what should you do? Here is what you should do. First of all, be informed. Secondly, identify whatever, uh, whatever um, industry you find yourself, identify your risks. And of course, you have to be able to manage those kind of risks. Those are the things that you must do. Next slide, please. To, to be more specific, what you should be doing, I think we should all join whatever groups, uh, join uh, various groups. Something that works very well in South Africa is the various private sector groups in all sort of forms. Uh, uh, join them, make sure that you join the Taxpayers Association, whatever the case may be, join a political party, whatever. Diversify your portfolio. Consider gearing your assets. That means you can go to the bank and ask the bank to lend you money against your assets. And then doing that, you get the bank to take some risk with you as, as, as well. And then, of course, don't break any laws, but make sure you pay as little tax as possible. And maybe just a last comment. And this is on a on a, from my personal, my advice, especially to younger people. And that is that um, 
I've presented many TV programs and I can remember the first time I presented the TV program and I was a complete and total nerve, complete wreck because there are lights and people talking in your ear and all some sort of things happening and then suddenly the red light goes on and you realize that you are on national TV. Um, and then my, and that first, that 10 seconds before the red light came on, I died a thousand deaths. And then the red light came on and two or three seconds, it was a little bit difficult and then I managed it and I could actually do it. And since then I presented many hundreds of TV programs. But the point I want to make, I never thought I would be able to do that, but I did it. And that's my advice to people. We are living in very difficult circumstances in South Africa. There's a lot of pain out there. There's a lot of things will be changing. And when things change, there are many opportunities out there as well. So my advice, especially to young people, try stuff that you don't think you will be able to do. And you will be absolutely amazed on what you can do. Thank you very much for listening to me. I will give it over to now to my esteemed um, colleague, uh, Professor Hughes, to talk a little bit about things that I know very little of and that is politics. Thank you very much. David, bye bye, donkeys. I'll take a plaisir uh, to watch you and to listen to you and to learn from you. And uh, we're gratified and, and humbled by your wisdom. Uh, I can relate entirely to your last comment about the TV and the nausea that you feel. Um, and the trick there is just to think that you're talking to the presenter, despite the fact that you may have a million people that you're talking to. So this morning, it's an absolute delight to be able to speak to uh, Warwick supporters, professional network clients as well. Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, looking forward to speaking to you. I'm going to chat more about politics, uh, global politics and local politics this morning. And um, the Darby's already laid the groundwork and um, whether you're a Marxist or not, or a materialist, you know, laying the economic groundwork for a, a political superstructure is terribly important. So thank you for that, Darby. This slide just tells you what I'm going to go through today, which is going from the global uh, realignment right the way through um, United States politics, South African politics. I'm even going to touch on the DA this morning because I think there's something important or potentially important happening in South African politics too. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you. So a few things, and Darby's touched on quite a few of these very, very eloquently. Uh, the one message I wanted to reinforce today is that we, as much as we speak about a post-COVID environment, we're not yet in it. And one of the reasons is that the uniqueness about this particular pandemic is the economic dimension to the pandemic. And it's the first time I can think of in living memory where governments uh, shut down their economies deliberately. You know, historically, 2008, we have the financial crisis, we have wars, etc. We have contagion effects in, in Asia. Uh, we have the collapse of certain economies. This is the first time where, you know, 192 countries shut down their economies. And in other words, we're in uncharted territory and there has to be a consequence. I think the consequences are, are going to be profound in the first instance. I think we're going to see a global realignment in terms of spheres of influence. And the question I know we're all confronted with now is, is when we see China rising and having this economic influence and trade influence, how will it rise politically and strategically? Will there be a cooperative relationship with the United States or will it be a conflictual relationship with the United States and indeed its, its neighbors as well? And I think that the United States election is going to be particularly important for giving a substance and flavor to that relationship. So we'll chat about that just now. The two spheres of influence are becoming clearer and I think they will become hardened as well. Darby touched on this issue of nationalism. Are we going to see greater regionalism or nationalism? We have been seeing a trend of nationalism, greater nationalism. And while that has, is, has been demonstrably popular, so nationalism uh, within Brazil, within Russia, within India, within China, uh, within Britain and the United States, it does have consequences. If we think about the post Second World War reconstruction, it was based on regional cooperation. And there's a very interesting maxim I'd like you to think about, and that is to say that 
countries who trade together, countries who, who are part of the same value chain, the same economic value chain, tend not to go to war with each other because there's a mutual interest in not going to war to disrupt those those value chains, those those production value chains. And that's been a maxim that I think has applied quite um, successfully over recent years. If you break those value chains, if you break those regional alignments, what's the incentive then, you know, to to actually ch trade cooperatively? But what's the incentive in terms of regional influence and strategic influence? And you can already see, I think, in the South China Sea, you know, that there's a lot of political military tension going on between China and Taiwan and even Britain uh, leaving the EU. One of the areas of conflict that's going to arise is, of course, fisheries as well, not just immigration. So I think we need to take seriously the fact that you can have a nationalist thrust. It may be popular at the hustings. It may get you elected, but it has consequences. I think we're also we're seeing uh, these um, strategic or international trade alliances or blocks being questioned very significantly. I'll never forget Rob Davis, uh, former Minister of Trade and Industry in South Africa, celebrating not the economic downturn 2008, 2009, but the emergence of BRICS. Why? Because BRICS has now emerged as a very strong uh, political and economic force, whilst the United States is in decline, Europe is in decline, and so on and so forth. In other words, it's a region or it's a block whose time has come. Its time may have come, but it also may have gone. And Ms. Darby touched on this as well, is that if you look at each of these countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and let's just leave South Africa to one side because it was only ever a proxy for Africa rather than an economy that fitted the BRICS bill, is that these, these countries are have a nationalist thrust. They have relatively little in common in terms of trade relationships. And indeed, two of them have, have been at a, a virtual war situation across their borders recently, that is to say, India and China. So I think these things are being undermined. The United Nations is being brought into question. The United States has pulled out of the WHO. I think that the WTO may be called into question as well. But certainly that architecture that we developed um, from Bretton Woods, the World Bank and the IMF, I think that its future is going to be questioned quite severely too. And one final point, um, although this is climate week, um, the climate change agenda has been, uh, the climate change has been pushed down the global agenda quite significantly whilst one's trying to deal with it a COVID economic crisis. And I guess the fundamental question is, you know, is this a luxury to have um, climate change policies in place or do we need to get ESCOM going? In other words, make sure the coal is delivered efficiently, even though we're adding to the, the carbon footprint of our country. So very important challenges facing the global economy. Thank you. Very quickly. Um, so we know that on November the 3rd, we have a, a United States presidential election. So it's the first Tuesday of November, even though some people are trying to change that date. So I just thought I'd quickly run through the two contenders there, President Trump and, and Joe Biden, and quickly run through their strengths and weaknesses. Um, and just run through some prospects for the United States election, because I think it's a very important election. So the most important issue for any president is the power of incumbency. You know, he or she theoretically can set the agenda, they control the military, they control the bureaucracy to some extent, they've got executive powers, they can sign orders, they control foreign policy in the United States, uh, they can set the agenda. And, and it is perfectly clear that not only is Donald Trump determined to serve a second term, He's talking about a third term and people close to him will say that he will do anything in his power to stay in office. Um, and I think we're going to see something quite interesting on, on election day too. And that is to say the way the election is going to be run and or rather the way the results are going to be tallied. So keep your eyes open for this is that Trump supporters, you know, those who tend or tending not to wear masks or going out in public or voting in person will vote in person. And about 87 percent of Trump supporters say they'll go out and vote on the day. If you contrast that with Joe Biden supporters, it looks like 47 percent of them are inclined to go out on the day. The rest will be postal votes. So what will that do? Well, what it will do on election night, it will show probably that President Trump has won by a landslide until those postal votes start coming in um, from the Democratic supporters. And so I'm not saying that you'll have a, a Bush Gore situation, but I do think that um, we're going to have some tense and interesting moments. And I'm not entirely sure that the American election will be determined 
you know, on the night of November the 3rd. I think you'll see it being played out days thereafter. What's interesting about Trump in this particular instance is that he's behind Biden and has been consistently behind Biden. And one would have thought that because he speaks to his base, he has a he's a powerful personality. Um, he's very much in control of his base as well. He's in control of the media by and large, despite being challenged by CNN, Washington Times, and et cetera, et cetera, the Washington Post and New York Times, is that he's been behind Biden consistently. And, and that, that chasm almost in voter support or in opinion polls has been up to 13, 14%. It's now dropping and it's dropping quite rapidly as well. So it was 9% um, a couple of weeks ago, it's dropping down to 7%. But his lead is actually less than Hillary, is, is slightly more than Hillary Clinton's was against Trump in 2016. So it, it is there's a far from clear picture that, that Trump will be re-elected. And if you look at the polls right now, uh, Biden would win the election if the polls were today. Let's have a look at Joe Biden in the next slide. So unlike Trump, he's very much a political insider, you know, a senator from Delaware. He knows the military. He served as the foreign relations uh, committee chair. He uh, was justice chair. He's been in the Senate uh, for a long, long time. Uh, interesting thing about his age, I was watching Bill Clinton yesterday, who's 74. Remember, Clinton was president 18 years ago. Uh, was it 18 years ago? 28 years ago. 28 years ago, Clinton was president. Uh, and he's still younger than Joe Biden. So Clinton's uh, 74, Joe Biden is 77. Uh, and that is a significant point to ponder too. He, unlike, um, unlike uh, President Trump, he's attempted to be in the centre of, of American politics, even you know, as a Democratic senator. His voting record is right dead centre in terms of the Democratic Party. He is going to play too and try and play on the sort of cross nationalism, cross ethnicity, cross gender, cross regional type of support base. And if you go on to his electoral website, um, he speaks to everyone. He speaks to Roman Catholics, he speaks to Jews, he speaks to Muslims, he speaks to the gay community, he speaks to Hispanics, he speaks to the working class, the wealthy and so on. He tries to capture that entire vote. So the question remains about Joe Biden. It's the question that Darby asked about the ANC. Who is Joe Biden? Who really is Joe Biden politically? What does he stand for? What can you rely on? We do know he's the opposite in political terms to, uh, to Donald Trump. But one is not entirely clear what he stands for. That is not clear. What one would expect under a Biden administration is obviously a hike in taxes and a very different international position, different regional position, different diplomatic position, and a different approach to security questions as well. Um, I think that the one telling thing we need to look out for, colleagues and friends, is, is the debates. And we know that those debates have been terribly important since 1960. You remember the, well, you will not remember, but the, many of, many people will, will know about the first televised debates between Richard Nixon and Jack Kennedy. And, and, and you know, really it was Nixon's election to, to lose, which he did. And he lost the election in 1960 because Kennedy was so eloquent. And you've seen historically where you have an, an eloquent speaker, you know, whether that's Clinton or Obama, it's terribly important in United States politics. And here's the problem for Biden is that he's not well. He's had two brain bleeds, as we know. Um, con consensus is that he's probably suffering from dementia. And if you look at any of the YouTube broadcasts that the, the liberals uh, media is trying to suppress, I think, in many respects, is, is Biden doesn't look intellectually competent. So the, the argument is he's a kind of a placeholder for the Democrats and that his uh, vice president, um, uh, Kamala Harris, would be effectively or de facto president. He's already said he's a transitional uh, candidate. And does the United States really want a transitional candidate or do they want strong and clear leadership? So I think Biden, for me, Biden is in trouble. And despite the polls, I think he's going to be in much more trouble uh, after the um, presidential debates, which start on September the 30th. Good. Next slide. Very, very quickly. Look, this was the this was the picture of the election in 2016. The red is Republican, in this case Trump, and the blue 
is Democrat, in this case, Hillary Clinton, and, and the pattern was very, very clear in those days. That is to say, the, uh, the large states such as California um, and New York, so the East, Co East Coast and West Coast, were democratic supportive, but look how, uh, Clint, how Trump took that heartland, not just the Rust Belt, but took states like Texas, you know, Arizona, Florida, very significantly down there, 29 votes, uh, North Carolina, um, very, very important. Uh, Illinois uh, stayed with the Democrats, but very important that um, that uh, Clint, uh, that uh, Trump uh, took a vast swathe of the United States with him. If we go to the next slide, you'll see the picture has changed somewhat. There's less red and there's more blue. Now, admittedly, these are opinion polls. But look at these significant states. Take, for example, down the bottom right hand side of the screen, Florida, critical, critical state, as we know from the 2000 election. Uh, Michael Bloomberg says he's going to spend $100 million making sure the Democrats win. Um, but look, Florida has switched in accordance with this poll from, from Republican to Democrat. And this particular poll puts the Democrats at 308 seats and the Republicans at 188 seats. Um, in the Electoral College. Remember the United States, you don't vote directly, you vote for an Electoral College, and those um, those candidates, those nominees, as is where those representatives pledge their votes for the president. So you've got to have yourself a, a winning margin or you've got to achieve 270 votes. So it, it's, it, for me, it's much more on the cusp, it's much more on the balance um, than perhaps people would expect. And I think that uh, we need to see how things develop internationally and locally uh, before we make a call on the election, despite the polls. Good. All right, let's come home. This is this is really important, and Darby has, has spoken about these issues. Uh, I just want to spend a little bit more time on on the ANC because you know the party. Not only is the party important, it is it is exceptionally important uh, in terms of South Africans' politics, the economy, and our future. So. I think what was significant over the past couple of weeks, we seem to have we have seen evidence of President Ramaphosa taking more control, not just of government in terms of the Corona crisis. And I think that we, with some exceptions, we've seen him do that. He's been uneven in his effectiveness, but I think he is becoming more. He's taking more control. Um, he is becoming somewhat more presidential. But what we saw recently with the NEC, the National Executive Committee, was, and the National Working Committee, was we saw um, some significant evidence of the president taking control, not just of the top six, but the NWC and the NEC. And this is, goes to what Darby was speaking about earlier, about the direction of the party, but the direction of the economy and the relationship of the government you know, to the state, to the economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there looked like there was the beginnings of a pushback against the president, which was initiated in part by his letter, the public letter, where he called uh, the ANC accused number one very consistent with what Darby said, but most unusual for a president of the ANC to call his own party accused number one. And the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was, of course, the corruption around the PPE, uh, protective equipment, personal protective equipment. And we've seen large scale corruption even at this time of need. And as much as the president said he wasn't surprised, I think everyone was probably surprised by the quantum of corruption uh, that has gone on. And I think he's not only politically embarrassed by that, I think he's using the opportunity to try and purge the party of those political opponents who are allied to or responsible for or identified with corruption. Next one, please. I don't think that this is a slam dunk at all, and I suspect that he may not win the battle for the heart and soul of the ANC, in part because it's been difficult to identify what the heart and soul of the ANC has been um, after Nelson Mandela and to some degree after Thabo and Becky too. We've seen people writing books literally titled that, you know, The Battle for the Soul, Gumedi's book of the ANC. And the fact of the matter it hasn't got one. And it doesn't mean to say it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have issues that bind it. It's a broad church and it's become a pragmatic church of convenience. 
In other words, it's been a channel for the occupation of state power. And one way, if you belong to the party and were identified with the party, that has provided you with not just political access, but access to other entities as well. And my contention is this, is that the party has been almost Leninist in its control of the state structures. It has permeated every level of the three tiers of government apart from the Western Cape. It's permeated every state-owned enterprise. It's permeated so-called black business and black economic empowerment. In other words, it's created a very highly integrated network of political and economic control. So it's a party that doesn't just have political control. It's a party that exercises economic control. And yes, it does so in part with Kasatu, but not entirely with Kasatu. And I concur with Darby's point of view there. My point of view is the following, is that the very nature, the organic nature, the way that the party has penetrated all structures of political and to some degree economic life in South Africa makes it very, very difficult and in my view, unamenable to reform. It's very, very difficult to reform this party. Why would you reform a party that A, has co political control, has institutional state control, has control of tenders, has control, control of policy, has control of most organs of state? Why would you reform that? It, it, it is illogical and it's not the way Leninist parties behave. So one has to question whether or not uh, President Ramaphosa is in fact sincere about reforming the party and irrespective of whether he is sincere or not, it is most unlikely he'll be able to do it. This is not a party that is amenable to reform because you de facto are attempting to reform an entire political economic structure. So you can look at certain scenarios where there's a clear cut victory for Ramaphosa in the NEC, that's fine. And Ramaphosa as the institutionist and the constitutionist deploys the National Prosecuting Authority, the Special Investigative Unit, the Zondo Commission to a root out corruption. In other words, root out his political opponents in a way that Thabo Mbeki tried and failed and was defeated. You can look at scenario two in which, sure, sure he, he keeps his position, he's not ousted, but in fact he ends up being weakened because it galvanizes opposition to him uh, within the African National Congress. And I think what we can see already, colleagues, is where there is, where you are saying that if you now need to step aside politically within the ANC, what does that mean? Are you stepping aside? Does it mean not taking up position? Does it, does it mean resigning from parliament, resigning from a municipality, resigning from a provincial administration? Uh, the ANC says, well, you know, it means stepping aside from political engagement. Does that mean you can't do your job? You can't, um, you can't take a salary, you lose your pension, etc. And so it, it remains a very vague and wishy-washy term. And that means that Cyril Ramaphosa hasn't grasp control and I'm not entirely sure that any political leader of the ANC can grab the extent of control required to reform this party. The third scenario is that the corruption is so deep within the ANC that in fact Ramaphosa loses the NEC uh, and this is what happened with Tabo Mbeki, he lost the NEC. Uh, it develops a momentum, you know, the NEC, uh, it has these meetings, it develops a sort of a, a momentum of its own and decisions are taken that leadership has to follow. And it is entirely possible because this is part of the preemptive strategy by Ramaphosa, it is entirely possible that Ramaphosa loses the NEC. And one of the reasons that I say that is not just because of the nature of the morphology of the party. If you look at the composition of the NEC, and I had to do this as, as an exercise the other day, because somebody said to me, an international uh, multinational said to me, who can we speak to in the NEC that will listen to what we have to say rationally? And I identified eight. So out of an NEC of about, 887, um, if you take all told, members of the NEC, I could identify eight people with whom you could engage rationally, intelligently, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, when I say intelligently, on the issues that, that you could get a hearing and they were not ideologically driven, etc, etc, etc. So one tenth. I, I think that that NEC um, is the locus of power in the ANC and I think it will do whatever it has to do to retain political power. And if that power is being threatened by reform, it will kick back against that reform as well. So 
what will happen when I think that the inevitability of this kickback happens? Well, I think if you take this to its logical conclusion, you would have to see the ANC splitting again. Now, we know that it's fractured. It fractured in 1959. We know it fractured with COPE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know it's absorbed other parties as well. But I think this is a somewhat more fundamental issue. And we've spoken a little bit, Darby spoke about ideology. I've spoken about what is it this party, what's intrinsic to this party. I think we're getting to the point in South Africa where the party has to identify what it is, what it stands for, what it's against, what it wishes to achieve. And this, you know, this reconstruction reform document that's about to come out if the public can eventually see it, if you don't have to get a sort of a, a leaked copy of it, that in itself, from what I've seen in the, in the engagements I have, will actually uh, put Kasatu de facto to terms. It'll put the bureaucracy to terms. It'll put the state-owned enterprises to terms, as we know they are in terms of Tito and Bawene. And I think this will be the precursor of what eventually will be a fight for the, for the soul of the ANC, which I suspect that the reformists and the constitutionalists um, like Ramaphosa will lose because they're in the absolute minority. Um, he has no political, he has no regional constituency, he has no ethnic constituency, he has no real class constituency within the ANC as, as a member of a black elite, as a billionaire. You know, it's not enough to have the support of uh, Patrice Motserpi and Adrian Gore. Uh, you don't win elections that way. You don't win support in the ANC that way. And my suspicion is even if he gets the, the reforms that he's looking for, I think he will lose power. And I suspect that the party will then split. Now, many people say that's not a bad thing. I think it will be a bloody fight, and I mean a politically bloody fight. And the question is, well, if it splits, where does it go? So let's just have a look. Let's have a look at the next couple of slides and see where the party may go. I don't, <laughs> I don't think they're going to see the party joining the DA. But I do think we're beginning to see something interesting in South African politics, and that is to say, possibly a beginning of the move away from purely or largely race based politics or ethnic based politics or regional politics, possibly towards issue based politics and perhaps even more class based politics. So when you look at these very competent and intelligent and accomplished black leaders of the DA, all of whom have left this party, what does it tell you? Well, it means that the party hasn't been very good about keeping its leadership. It means that it's mismanaged itself in many respects. Um, it may tell you there's a cabal, a white cabal in the DA that um, is still racist and still doesn't trust black people to lead it. Or it may say actually there's an ideological battle that's gone on in the DA. And I think the latter is more the case. And I, I say I, all of these people on the screen, I know one, two, three, four of them reasonably well. And I've worked with them as well. And I've, I've hopefully advised them reasonably well. Um, and I do believe, strange enough, that they do and should have had a home in the DA. And I think the DA has been wrong to lose them as leaders. I really, really do. But that's not that's not telling you the full story about what's going on in the DA. Possibly the next slide does. And that is, I think that the DA now, and this is a very different complexion to a party, the DA now was unhappy with the leadership of Muzi Maimani, that is true, but it took, um, it took its own identity quite seriously. And it said, if we continue on this race-based race -based policies, which remember it endorsed BEE rather reluctantly a few years ago, what distinguishes us as the DA from the ANC under Cyril Ramaphosa? We are on a hiding to nothing. So there's a political agenda here. What are we going to do? Our strategy about picking up black urban votes around Gauteng and elsewhere. Sure, it worked in the in the local government elections, but that was under you know an opposition that was under the leadership of Jacob Zuma, where you knew you could pick off Gauteng, etc., etc., etc. Under, under Cyril Ramaphosa, things are very different. So I think a brave, some would say naive, step has been taken by the DA where it said, you know what, no more race-based policies. We're not doing that anymore. We're not endorsing black economic empowerment. What we're going to say is that our policies will be orientated towards our principles. We'll develop economic policies, industrial policies, developmental policies, health, agriculture policies but they'll be needs based. In other words, we'll try and achieve these economic growth objectives. We'll try and achieve higher growth rates and employment, 
but it'll be needs tested. It will not define that need by virtue of race, or ethnicity, or any other form of identity other than these objective principles. What does that do? Well, it may mean that the party recovers a little bit of the support that it lost uh, in the 2019 election, and maybe they, I think they did lose a, few, a couple of a thousand voters uh, to, to the Freyheit's front, that is true. I think it also means it may continue to shrink as a party. But what I do think it means is that you'll have a party that is very clear about what it stands for. It's quite a brave departure and it, it won't break the mold of South African politics, but it will say South African politics doesn't have to be race based. If we really want to get growth going, if you really want to tackle 40 percent unemployment, if you really want to tackle inequality, if you really want to help the rural poor, then you need to go towards developmental policies that have effect rather than just merely rewarding people or, or countering inequality on the basis of race. So I think we're in for interesting times with the DA. Where does that lead us? Well, I think it takes us back and don't go back to the slide B, but what I'm saying is if there is a split in, in, in the African National Congress, and there already is, but if there's a de facto split in the African National Congress, we may be in a situation in South Africa with formations can be more principle orientated, policy orientated, more very clear about their economic policies, social policies, trade policies, security policies, not purely on the basis of history, rectifying history, doing away with apartheid, but actually on the future of South Africa. Where do you go? What does that lead us towards? And we'll see this next year. It leads towards alliance politics. And that's exactly where South Africa is headed. And we'll see it next year. And I think we'll see it in the next general election. Is South Africa is moving away from, I think, purely race-based and identity politics towards issue and coalition politics. That can cleave the other way, and there's no one saying that the EFF will not become power brokers, and I think that they will become power brokers if they align more closely with Kasatu, South African Communist Party, regional political formations too. Absolutely can become a very, very strong party above 10%, but I think South African politics will become much, much clearer. Who is progressive? Who is pro-economy? Who is broadly speaking pro-free market? Who is recalcitrant? Who is dealing with race-based politics? And who hasn't dealt with corruption? So I think we're in for very, very interesting times in South Africa. Mark, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully we've said enough to stimulate some interesting questions and feedback. Brilliant. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Davi. Um, I think it was just outstanding speakers and, and some really topical things to look at. Just always like what Davi says and uh, how, how honest and direct he is. You know, this is what's happening in the country. And we can look away from it and shy away from it, but ultimately it's where we're at. Um, and from Tim's side, obviously, you know, the, the political scene in South Africa obviously probably being more, more important than uh, a lot of other countries out there, um, especially in the position we're in right now. So guys, thank you very much. I think it were, I think those presentations were really, really brilliant. We have some great questions here. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do is gonna go through a couple of them. We've got a couple of minutes and then I'll just hand over to either Tim or Davi. Um, so the first question we got here from Anonymous is, do you think South Africa is already in a debt trap and can we still get out of it? And Davi, I know you, you touched on it, but there's a lot of concern out there of, you know, realistically, can we get out of it? Um, obviously we know the public wage will say is a big worry. So Davi, over to you. Yeah, OK, let, let's just understand uh, or let's just understand. Yeah, you know, we've got many examples in the world where, where countries follow follow the same sort of pattern that South Africa finds itself in at the moment. Uh, what happens is that you get a government with good intentions, wanting to redistribute income. And of course, it gradually becomes more and more corrupt, like what we've seen with the ANC government. So the first thing, they, they obviously they, they need money for all these things, all their dreams, and of course they need money for other things as well. So the first thing that you usually see is that eventually your taxpayer cannot carry the burden anymore. Now we pass that. The taxpayer, we, we will see tax increases, uh, but uh, but uh, I don't. Uh, uh, the taxpayer simply cannot uh, carry much heavier burden than is currently happening. The second thing is, uh, you still need money. So what do you do? And these things do not happen. Sometimes it happens simultaneously, uh, but you also need uh, you need money. And the, the next port of call is simply to use your existing capital. ESCOM or the destruction of ESCOM is a good example of that, or South African Airways. So we've destroyed much of the existing capital. There's still a lot of capital that we can fall back upon, uh, onto, but we've pretty much destroyed the available pool of capital in the country. 
The third port of call is the available uh, pot, the only available uh, pot of gold that is left, and that's this, the savers. That, of course, is prescribed assets for the, the, the pension funds. I believe, well, if we continue on this trajectory, then we are going to see prescribed assets. Uh, it's inevitable because the money must come from somewhere. I do not know, for example, how ESCOM can survive financially. It's impossible for them. So we need 250 billion rand or so just to get ESCOM on a financially stable basis again. And the money must come from somewhere. The taxpayer cannot do that. Um, and of course, with prescribed assets, you usually find um, foreign exchange regulations that are tightened up as well. Uh, and eventually, you run out of that as well. And then we're not there yet. Uh, we haven't uh, run out of that. We don't have prescribed assets and so yet. And foreign, we've always had uh, foreign exchange regulations. I think it's going to be tightened a little bit more. But eventually, this whole thing always ends the same, and that's with very high levels of inflation. Now, inflation is a horrible thing, high inflation because it distorts economies and it leads to it's inflation is the financial equivalent of a, of a civil war, basically. So I think that's where we're heading for. We are heading for inflation. But there's one good thing about inflation and inflation erodes the value of money, but it also erodes the value of debt. If you look at the, the, the British, um, uh, the British debt just after the Second World War, 60 percent of Britain's debt after the Second World War was paid off through inflation. So inflation is always um, a way of reducing your debt, debt burden. Uh, so from that point of view, no, we're not in a debt trap really. Another point, and that basically comes down to the, to the, to the point that if you're a sovereign country and the bulk of your debt is, in, is RAND denominated, which is the case in the case of South Africa, 90% of, of the state's debt is RAND, de RAND denominated, then you can never default because you can simply print more money. Of course, you're going to pay a price, and the price that you're going to pay is that you're going to see very high levels of inflation. So, no, no we're not really in a debt trap from that point of view. But if your question is, are we in a, in a fiscal situation where things are going to get progressively worse, then I'm afraid certainly we are there. We are in a fiscal situation. I've done the numbers, but if you really want to stabilize the fiscal accounts, we have to cut back on state spending to the tune of approximately 10%. In the real terms, which is politically extremely difficult to do, and the more the longer we wait, the more we accumulate more and more debt, and the more difficult it becomes in future to turn this thing around. So uh, I think we are in trouble on the fiscal accounts, and we are in very very deep trouble. And I do not see we get we us getting out of this now. So I think from that point of view, one can say that we are in a, a debt trap in, in the sense that things from now on will get progressively worse. Uh, I think that is, yeah, that's my answer. Brilliant. Thanks, Davi. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's an interesting question. I think it's a real, real tough thing out there. Um, ultimately, you know, I think if, if politically we're in the right position, that's why politics is so important. We, we probably could get the country moving in the right direction. The, the political will, you know, after Tim's speech is, is yeah. just simply not there, um, which I think is, is hugely concerning. Um, then secondly, another question for you, Davi. Uh, do you think the US economy will recover at a faster pace than the South African economy post-COVID? Yeah, yes, I believe that. I believe so for various reasons. One important reason is that the US stimulus that they've received from a fiscal and monetary uh, policies are really big. Now, remember the US dollar is the, is the world's dominant currency and they can literally print money or well, they can print wealth because everybody still accepts the US dollar. So the monetary authorities could do, could really go out of their way to support the economy by cutting interest rates to very, very low levels and through this thing called quantitative easing. And they can, can get away with that because it is a so-called hard currency. We can't do that. Uh, the South African Reserve Bank, they did print a little bit of money, not much, only about 35, 36 billion rand or so. Um, so we can't do that because we've got a rand, we don't have a dollar, uh, which gives the Americans an extraordinary benefit in the economy that, that monetary policy can be as accommodative as it is. Secondly, for pretty much the same reason, the Americans can stimulate the economy on, the fiscal, on their fiscal accounts and have done that to a huge extent. So again, the Americans, they can borrow more and more money because there's always people out there, including South Africa, that want to keep on lending money to the Americans because you've, you, uh, you've got surplus dollars and you want to invest it somewhere and you invest it 
basically by lending money to the American government. So they, their support to the economy was significantly greater than that what we had in South Africa. In the case of South Africa, the Reserve Bank did cut interest rates, they did support the economy as far as they possibly could, they made certain adjustments as far as the banks are concerned for liquidity requirements and capital requirements, and they even did print some, a little bit of money. But the Reserve Bank can't do more than that. They've done as much as they possibly can. On the fiscal accounts, uh, they talk about the 500 billion stimulus program. It certainly was not a 500 billion rand stimulus program. It's probably maybe 150 billion or so if you really want to, if you look through all the programs that have been announced. So it's a, it's a drop uh, uh, in the bucket, uh, the fiscal support to the South African economy. We simply cannot do more because of the mismanagement of fiscal accounts previously. And that's the reason. So the South African economy, there will be a lot of noise, a lot of volatility. Uh, in the fiscal and the numbers, like I've explained, uh, but we're not going to see strong economic growth. The Americans, on the other hand, is likely to be significantly stronger economic growth than in the case of South Africa for the reasons that I've mentioned. Thanks, Davi. Yeah, I mean, I think these things are, are so, so important when you look at, you know, South Africans look at where, where they need to invest, you know, what, is thing, what are things going to look like in 5, 10, 20 years around the world? And ultimately, I think you're right that the, the US economy um, it's quite a robust machine. Um, although it's taken a dip, like most economies in the world out there, I think the, the ability to get back to where they were and grow from there is probably a lot more, a lot more aggressive than, uh, than we can um, as, a, as a country. All right, then uh, we've got a question here for Tim. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Tim. Very interesting. Do you think that a split in the ANC is ultimately inevitable, perhaps in the medium or long run? Yeah, so hopefully the, the questioner um, saw the presentation before <laughs> because I think that's the determining point. I wanted to make two points about South African politics. Number one, South African politics uh, is the ANC. Uh, like it or not, um, what the ANC does determines how the state behaves, how the state behaves to some degree, significant degree, uh, determines policy, determines the economy, determines how well we tackle unemployment, inequality, underdevelopment and the like. I can't emphasize enough how important the party is and that's why I called it Leninist. When Margaret Thatcher embarked on her reforms from uh, May 1979, it wasn't the case that the Conservative Party occupied all state apparatuses. That is not the case. The trade unions were strong. Um, you know, you, you did have state-owned enterprises, British Rail, British Steel, etc., etc., etc. It was a policies and a steely personality and a determined, um, a determined cabinet that that forced through those reforms. This is not what you have in the ANC, and I need to place, uh, again, let me please emphasize the point. The ANC has ingratiated itself in all areas of the state apparatus, all of them. There is no, whether it's sport, sport in South Africa is highly politicized and controlled by ANC supporters, irrespective of its incompetence, whether it's cricket, or whether it's athletics or, you, or soccer, you name it. Every aspect of South African society has been captured. It was a point made, I think, by Helen Ziller in, a, in an opinion piece either today or some other. Yeah, today I think it was. And she made the very shocking point, and it's hard to swallow, that there is more race based legislation today than there was under the National Party. Admittedly, objectively, trying to achieve different things and nominally based on trying to correct the past and to, and to create a more just and equitable society. But that's the situation we're in at the moment. Now, my contention again, just to reiterate the point, is that having been part of this, being rapporteur to the, you know, the document that was being developed between BUSA, or the document that went to Nedlac, um, having been part of that process to some degree anyway, it was clear that there was some degree of consensus between the ANC and the National Working Committee in Okorangwana, Mashatili and those people, and Kaskovardia and Martin Kingston, that is true, and even Zandili Zungu, but they constitute an elite. They still constitute an elite that still needs to try and achieve some profound changes in the South African political economy. And when the penny drops about what this economic policy requires, when the penny drops that you can't fund uh, South African airways, when you penny drops that you cannot continue 
with this level of uh, state uh, employment or, or bureaucracy, when the penny drops that you can't afford to fund these state-owned enterprises, when the penny drops that there is no more money, that you can't borrow any more money, that really is a, going to be a very sobering point. And this document that's going to be produced is almost like an election manifesto. It's a manifesto about, about Cyril Ramaphosa's presidency and what he stands for. When that penny drops, it will be a declaration of war. I, I, I'm not exaggerating insofar as it's an economic declaration of war. That will be followed through by machinations within the African National Congress, the populists, etc., will come out of the woodwork, those that are being targeted by the SIU or targeted by the NPA. And there will be a war about what this ANC is, and that inevitably will not lead to a more unified ANC. It will lead to a split in the ANC. And I think there is a, there is virtually an inevitability about that. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> and once again, in a country like South Africa, which uh, is quite, quite unique, I think when we look at what's happening in the world, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Generally, you, you do have a, a party to, to the one side where it's fairly, um, I would say, communist, but quite socialist in nature. And you probably compare it to, to the likes of the Democrats. And then to the other side, probably more, more capitalist in nature, probably related to, to the Republicans. And the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. But in South Africa, you know, as a, as a one party political system, you know, change is coming. Um, whether it's in four years, eight years or 12 years away, I think change is coming and I think the, the interesting thing is that what's going to happen during this period of change. If the ANC does start to, to rapture and uh, you do see a signs of a split coming, are we going to see more uh, populist policies? Uh, are we going to see things that are, are more focused on the masses and, and quite potentially having a, a negative effect on the economy in the long run? So, you know, I think it's, a, it's an interesting world win. Um, it's a changing world, undoubtedly. And I think COVID's probably brought quite a few things to the front where the change is coming through a lot quicker. So, yeah. Um, so, Bianca, if you can just put us on the next slide then. So, guys, I would like to thank everybody for joining. Unfortunately, we are running out of time and uh, we've got probably another 20 questions that we could have run through. I could probably sit and, and, and chat with Darwin Tim for another hour about these things. Um, but ultimately, you know, we, it's an interesting world win. And I think. Uh, changes upon us and it's so so important for individuals financial advisors and other individuals out there to really just look at their own situation and get professional advice uh, probably more important to have good financial advice in the current scenario than it's been in a very very long time there's a lot of things up in there prescribed assets how much you should invest internationally so warwick as a local and international specialist company um, if you want a second opinion on your investment portfolio or quite simply just want to talk to you about how do I invest internationally, how do I diversify my wealth, please feel free to contact us on 800 50 50 50 or contact us via email on clientcare at warwickwealth.com. Uh, we will also be making contact with all the attendees in the session just to thank them for, for making uh, or joining the session and registering. And uh, we will also be making a video of the presentation available online and on our website. So from our side, Dolly, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate having you here. Tim, great as always. And everybody, have a great day and a great week. Thank you. Thank you very much.